called me because they're being affected by the poor. Terrible situation. I'm Bob Lewis. I'm the pastor of Contemporary Service, and I'm excited to be here to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. As we remain standing as we do our call to worship. I want to solo the Lord at all times. His praise always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord in me. Let us exalt his name together. Let's sing these songs like we have a risen Savior who has saved us from the proper penalty of sin. Amen. Darkness flees. <laughs> the Bible says, hey, see that it's in you and see that it's in the world. I think sometimes we get reminded that, that we have that power through Christ. We don't have to be scared of people. Times are troubling. We're living in troubling times right now, but we have someone that is greater and that's greater than anything. Has more power and authority than any human on this planet. The song says, I know who goes before me. I love 
Good morning, One Community Church. My name is Vicki Dudash, and I'm the Executive Director uh, here at the church, and I wanted to share a few announcements with you this morning. Uh, the first is a really big announcement, and beginning uh, next Sunday on March 13th, we are going to uh, move the start time of the contemporary service forward 15 minutes. So our contemporary service will begin at 9.45, and that starts next Sunday, March 13th. Uh, we've coordinated that so that everybody can remember that next Sunday when we spring our clocks forward an hour, uh, we're going to spring our worship service uh, forward 15 minutes. So our traditional service will continue to begin at 11 o'clock um, as it always has. So I uh, wanted to also let you know the last Sunday of this month on March 27th, we are going to have our annual church congregational meeting and that will begin at 12 o'clock, 12.15. Father, I pray that the fellowship would be precious. Father, I pray that the prayers would, 
will be answers to our prayers. And Heavenly Father, I pray that the word that is spoken this day, Father, will help to edify us, help us to be godly representatives for you. And Father, I'd be remiss if I just didn't pray, Father. Lord, please continue to give wisdom and direction to all of our world leaders, Father. Please have the God. You are the God of angel armies, Father. Please be with those people who are in the Ukraine, Father. Watch over and protect them. Give them faith, give them strength, and give them hope. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. I love that song, too. The God of angel armies. Most of you are way too young. I challenge you if you've never watched the Cliff Wilson show, and it goes way back to perfect use some of his, his famous quotes. And once again, if you're too young, you've never seen the Cliff Wilson show, please get on YouTube. And the next statement I'm going to tell you about him, I want you to look it up. Cliff Wilson was so funny. I, I'm thinking he probably was like in the, the early to the, the mid-70s. And another one of the same that he would have, he would never take the blame for anything that he did wrong. And what he would always say is, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And I think, I think today, though, people give too much credit to Satan. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This morning, I'll be preaching from God from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And we started that the season of Lent. And in this story, we know that Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Lord, have mercy. How in the world did he do that? Y'all heard me say one time I'm fasting. And I, I, I didn't eat breakfast. I didn't eat lunch. And my daughter came by the house for something. I'm laying on the bed like a half dead. My blood sugar dropped. And she was all worried. Oh, Dad, let me get you something to eat. Lord Jesus, I can't, I can't fast 40 days. But the purpose of a fasting is a time to reflect. It's a time to sacrifice, giving up things that we normally would do to make time to be alone with the Lord, to be to truly be in solemn prayer. And Jesus fasted that forty days and night, even though he's the Son of God, he also was human. And if if our Lord and Savior Realize the importance of fasting and prayer and solemn prayer, being alone with God because his ministry was getting ready to start. And he, he knew that he had 11 sometimes faithful men at the beginning. They kind of weigh with their faith like we do sometimes, but would be pillars of the church. He knew that there would be many challenges for them and for him. And he knew that it was important for him to spend that. 40 days and 40 nights in solemn prayer, fasting, getting closer to his heavenly Father. So if, if our Lord and Savior didn't do that, we know that we need to be really depending on spending time in solemn prayer and fasting and, and drawing closer to God. This morning, I'm going to be speaking on depending on God's written word. Where would we be without the Holy Spirit of God and without God's written word. We have to lean on it. We have to depend on it so much. God will allow believers to be tempted and tested. I'm going to say that again. It's so important. God will allow believers to be tempted and tested. Matthew chapter 3 verse 16 tells us that Jesus was just baptized. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, Heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God sitting like a dove and alighting on him. Praise God also for his Holy Spirit. And this is, once again, we have to really be mindful of this. God will allow believers to be tempted and tested. God never himself will tempt us, but he will allow us to be tempted. And if God will allow us to be tempted, it's a test for us. It's, an, it's a spiritual examination where we can really see where we are. And I always say this, and I'm sure many of you probably feel the same way too. 
think about some of the most difficult trials, temptations, tests that you've gone through. And I think about some of the most difficult ones that I've gone through. And if someone were to ask you, would you go through that again? I'd be the first one to say, no way. I almost lost my mind when I was going through that. But God will allow us to be tempted and tested. A lot of times it's a way where God says, oh, I see. You got it. And, and like maybe some of the more like Pentecostal type churches may say, oh, you done got saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. So now you don't even talk to me in prayer. So God sometimes will allow things to go on in our life. It's a way to drive us to our knees. To be humble so that we can rely on him. And it's a way to humble us sometimes. We have to realize that God gave us that Holy Spirit for a reason. We need to lean on that. And as I, and as I continue preaching today, we'll talk more about our adversary, the devil, and how cunning he is at, at deceiving God's people. Verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And I know some people would even, would even think like, no. The Holy Spirit, why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus to be with the devil? Sometimes we have to see where we are spiritually. Sometimes we need to be tested. And I found this in my, you know, I, you all know that I love sports so much. And, and I've said this before, the great Tom Landry, who was a strong man of faith, a strong Christian, who was the coach of the Dallas Cowboys when they were really good. And he would say that my job is to make men do what they don't want to do so they can achieve what they want to achieve. And I know from just playing sports and academically, spiritually, the time that we grow the most is when we're pushed the hardest. When we, when we think, I can't go another step. I can't do it anymore. That's when we become who God truly intended for us to be. So oftentimes, God will allow us to be tempted. To be tested so we can really become who God has called us to be. Now, unfortunately, sometimes, you know the old saying, if it doesn't make you, it may break you. Sometimes that does happen. That's why we have to depend on prayer, fasting, reading God's word. And so what's so interesting in verse 1, when it says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, when when you look at that in the Greek, what it literally means was he was in an uninhabited region. That means there was nobody else there to help him. He was by himself. And when I looked in, in Mark, Mark chapter 1 verse 13, it says that there were also wild beasts there. So there were no people there. Just wild beasts and Jesus. So you can't depend on anyone else. He was totally on his own. And it says the, that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. These are some of the, the definitions from the Greek regarding the devil, the slanderer. Have you ever had someone lie on you and tell many people? I see some heads being nodded. And you've ever had someone lie on you? And people believe it. I've had that happen before. When people even came and said, why did you do that? And I'm like, why did I do what? Why did I do what? Satan will work through other people to slander us. And one thing that I've learned, when you are boldly serving the Lord, you better be ready to be tested and tempted by Satan. You're a spiritual threat. Why do you think Satan's attacking Jesus? You're a, you're a spiritual threat to him. He's a slanderer, treacherous informer. 
Satan will go to other people. And I tell you what will happen too. Sometimes he'll go to the people closest to you in your own family. The people in your own I'm not being asked to raise your hand or not head. Have you ever been slanted by people in your own family? I know some of you have. Treacherous and former and a traitor. Have you ever had or someone you really thought was your friend and loved you and just totally turned against you? It happens. And oftentimes, especially if you're boldly serving the Lord, you better be ready. You better be prayed up, filled with the Holy Spirit, fasting, reading God's Word, memorizing God's Word. I always, I always look at it this way. What would I do if I didn't have my Bible? That, one of the Bibles that I had, I've had it probably 25 years. If someone stole that Bible from me or got caught in a fire, I'm going to tell you now, I would be in mourning. I truly would. I spent so much time with that Bible. I've put so many notes in it. I've read it so often when I was in a tough place and I needed God's word to get me through. I would, I would struggle greatly. And I memorized God's word. And I always think of this way. What would I do if I was on a deserted island and I didn't have a Bible? I need to know God's word. So I can depend on God's word, so, so I can lean on it, so it can get me through the difficult times in my life. Jesus had just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now, this is bad enough to fast 40 days and 40 nights, and it'd be just exhausted. I wouldn't have been to open my eyelids if I fasted 40 days and 40 nights. There's no way that I could. But then, the Holy Spirit led Jesus to be with the devil alone in an uninhabited region when he is physically weak. And I don't know about y'all, but when I'm when I'm when I have I missed time eating, not only am I physically weak, I'm mentally weak. You know, I'm spiritually weak. And I'm in Burger City before. I'm like that Snickers commercial. I'm not I'm not me when I'm hungry. I'm serious. I, if I go too far, I get mean. <laughs> and all I can focus on, I need some food. I need a nap. I gotta eat it right now. I'm gonna lose my mind. I'm gonna go crazy. So, Lord, how did Jesus do that? After being that hungry, now he has to stand under the attack of the devil. Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Oftentimes, I said it earlier, we need to see where we are spiritually and where we need to improve at. Now, obviously, Jesus was, is God's son, but he still was human. So his flesh was to, to be weak like ours. And I was just studying in the Bible, and I was looking at a couple of examples. Moses fasted 40 days and 40 nights when he wrote the Ten Commandments. Can you imagine if God called you to write the Ten Commandments? I'd be so nervous. And I might even think about doing how it goes, like with a chisel and, and trying to do it that way. But I could imagine having that great responsibility. My hand would be shaking. I'd be like, Lord, put my hand steady. That's a lot of responsibility. Writing the Ten Commandments. Moses needed to be in solemn prayer. He needed, and the Lord knows he needed to be away from those people who we let out slavery. Because we all know the story. He needed 40 days and 40 nights of fasting and prayer to deal with those people. And when you're, when you're boldly serving God, you have great responsibility in the church and the community. And you're dealing with, with people. And we're supposed to to love people the way God loves people. But when we're, when we're serving people, we're ministering to people, a lot of times people are hurting. They're in pain. They're misguided. So you have to be spiritually strong 
to be able to help people in those situations. Elijah fasted 40 days and 40 nights during his journey to Mount Moore, which is called the Mount of God. That's from 1 Kings 19.8. And Moses and Elijah are two of the most revered men in the Old Testament. Fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. So we know that Jesus, he was physically born. And I sit and outside of the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't know how a person can fast that long. I've always understood, and those who are medical people may know better than me, but I always thought that maybe only three days you could probably go without drinking and be able to function properly. And maybe I'm wrong about that. That's something that I've always heard. But physically, he had to be very weak. Believers, be prepared for attacks from the devil. The tempter came to him and said, The devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread, which was the first temptation. When I was reading through this, too, I was offended at the disrespect that the devil showed our Lord and said, the tempter came to him and said, if, I was, I was fired with that, why are you going to say if to my Lord and say, <laughs> if you are the son of God, tell me some, become bread. And Satan, Satan is just so cunning, he's wild. You know, when someone says something like that, they're dealing with your pride. When he was saying, if you are, so now it's like, what you mean, if I am? I'll show you. That's exactly what he wanted to do. He was trying to make Jesus feel like he had to defend who he is. And if he were to say that to, to, to many human beings, we would fail that test. Fine. If you really are a godly man and a godly husband, Prove it to me then. We have to be prayed up. And Jesus says to him in verse 4, It is written, Man should not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And you know the thing that really bothered me here too is that Satan was bold enough to command Jesus. He said, tell me something. And the Greek, that was an imperative. Once again, and I'm not joking, I'm very serious. I was, in, every time I read this, I'm insulted. How dare he speak to our Lord and Savior in the imperative? Now just think about this though. If the devil was bold enough to speak to Jesus, the Son of God in that manner, how do you think he will deal with us? And he's just so slick. You know, I usually would watch shows you know, dealing with demonic activity in homes. They're fascinating, but I stopped watching them because I feel like if I do that, I'm going to open up an opportunity for, for some satanic attack. And I shared this when we first started attending here, that I know that we had some activity going on in our home. I know that we did. We were downstairs in our house, and there's a bedroom upstairs. <coughs> we heard a thud as long, as loud as if I pulled this, pushed this podium over. It sounded like a 300-pound man had jumped off the dresser, and then like you ever watch the superheroes? They land, and they, when they land, how they land like like this? <laughs> That's what it sounded like. There was no explanation for it, and. Whenever there's something like that, when our kids were little and they would scream or anything like that, I'm always gone running. I'm like turning the corners really tight. I ran the step. Lori came up probably about, this is some way faster than her. But she came up like 30 <laughs> seconds after I got up there. And I'd already assessed the situation when she came in. I didn't see anything. When Lori finally got up there too, she didn't see anything. There is no explanation of that. I mean, it was a boom. We literally felt our house in it. There's no explanation for it. 
Now, I also would share when I first started here, when we first started here, we had two bread machines on a counter. And we were upstairs, and it's funny, both times these incidents happened, we were in the opposite level of the house. We were upstairs, and the bread machines were going. And we hear like, BAM! Super loud. <laughs> and once again, Lori came down about 30 seconds after me. I assessed the situation. And both bread machines were off the counter. And they were several feet away from the counter. I didn't think to take a picture of it because I'm like, I was like, oh, what's going on here? How in the world did they vibrate off the counter? And not fall right here, but they were over here. And I thought about it, like, what's going on here? Why are we under this attack? And the only thing I can think of is that I've been, I've been sharing, and I, and I am to this day, have been sharing the gospel, and the Lord has blessed me to see so many people come to the Lord to get saved. And I truly believe that was Satan's way of saying that you need to stop. You need to stop. And you know I'm hard at it. <laughs> I ain't stopping. The God of angels and armies is by my side. And this made me more determined. And I, we went through the house and prayed at every level of the house, every room of the house. Y'all, we got so many Bibles and crosses in our house. <laughs> All over. This is my way of letting Satan know, no, I'm not here. Not here. And we're not changing what we're doing either. Be prepared for attacks from the devil. So Jesus rebuked the devil by quoting Deuteronomy 8 3. Verse 5 tells us, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And this is going to show us Satan will attack him anywhere. He led Jesus on top of the temple. Satan will attack you right here in church. He's that bold. Be prepared. You are boldly serving the Lord. So he takes Jesus to the highest point of the temple. And the second temptation, if you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And if you read this carefully, he misquoted scripture there also. But he is a deceiver and a slander, a treacherous informer and a traitor. So he will misquote scripture. He will confuse us to cause us to sin against God. In verse 7, Jesus answered, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God, to the test. Satan was tempting Jesus on both of these tests to be out of God's will. But Jesus stood firm, and you notice, he kept quoting Scripture. And Jesus was always quoting Scripture to rebuke people and to stay in God's will. Verse 8 and 9. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and show them all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And Satan says this to our Lord and Savior. All of this I will give you. Once again, I got fired up. I was thinking, how are you going to give this to my Lord and Savior? You didn't even it's not yours to give away. But Satan will deceive us. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And once again, I got fired up. I was fired up this week going through this. G Satan was telling Jesus, I'll give you what I, what I don't possess. He's a, he's a liar. Because how, how can you give somebody something that you don't have possession of? And, then, and what he really wanted Jesus to do was to sin. He wanted our Lord and Savior to literally bow down, prostrate, and, and worship him. Worship, true worship is about us Praising our divine God. 
Satan is not God. I'd lose my life before I bow down to worship Satan. And then Jesus says to him, and, and you know, Satan was speaking in the apparent command of Jesus. So Jesus came back, I was like, no, Jesus, no, Jesus, no. And he says to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. But you know what I was thinking when I was reading verse 8, where Satan said, I will give you all the kingdom and the world in their splendor. You know what I was thinking about? And Satan said to some people, he took them, he took them to the highest pinnacle of a bank building. And Satan said to some people who are strong believers, if you bow down and worship me, I'll make sure that you don't have to pay all those two loans. Boy, well, some people would jump down there and he's so quick and be worshiping Satan. And he said, I'll make sure that your credit score is so low, you can refinance your home. Or you can buy that beautiful home you're going to get. Some people would be like, where's the line Satan? I signed my name right here. And I'm saying this in a joking manner, but we know that there are many Christians in high positions who yield the temptation and it ruin their ministries. My wife and our family were serving in a church. And when we had gone to seminary, we got a, a, we got a letter in the mail from, from the, ch the church that we had come from. And it actually split off because of a pastor from the, from the original church. And we received a letter in the mail saying that he was no longer the pastor. Because three women had come forward from the church, and he had been involved with all three of them. So people who are in high places, serving God, fall to those temptations. So people are laughing like, oh, he's so funny. Those things happen. There are many people who have been serving to God for a long time. This person led my wife and I to the Lord. And many other people, this person led led 11 or 12 men to the Lord who all became pastors. But that but fell in that way. When you are boldly serving the Lord, you have to be prepared for those kind of attacks. So Jesus once again commanded him. And you notice Matthew said Satan this time has come from a Hebrew word, which means the adversary, the opponent, the enemy. When a person is your enemy, they want to destroy you. Satan desires to destroy the godly image that we have as believers. And then lastly, verse 11. Obedience to God's word is required to defeat the devil. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Satan left Jesus. He left him alone. And he'll leave us alone if we do these things. Jesus submitted to God's will. Jesus resisted the devil's temptation. And I, this is one of my favorite verses in, in the Bible. I, you know, I say this all the time, but this is one of my favorite ones too. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves to the will of God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's what happened to Jesus. And that's what we have to do. And then it's, what I like here so much in verse 11, in the Greek Bible, Matthew uses the word edu, and it means see, and it's always in the imperative. And he was saying, he was commanding believers, see, you believers, that the angels came and ministered to our Lord and Savior. And he was saying, and they'll minister to you. Submit yourselves to the, to the will of God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Depend on God's written word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the privilege to read and teach and preach your word. And Father, I speak to all who are within the sound of my voice, Father, that we would all depend on God's word. Father, that we would read it, that we would meditate on it, that we would memorize it, Father. Psalm 119.11 says, Thy word have I treasured in my heart, 
so I will not sin against you. Father, help us to lean heavily. Help us to be addicted to your word. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus I pray. Amen.
they that to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant filled in my blood, shed for you the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving gift of the risen Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. This is part of life. Now may the love of God and Father 
and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you.